Olá, esse é o Poder Entrevista e eu sou Paulo Silva Pinto, editor sênior do Poder 360. Vou entrevistar o ministro do Trabalho e Economia da Áustria, Martin Kocher. Martin Kocher tem 50 anos, nasceu em Salzburg, tem graduação e doutorado em Economia. Foi diretor do Instituto de Estudos Avançados em Viena. É ministro desde 2021. Em visita ao Brasil nesta segunda-feira, 15 de abril de 2024, em Brasília, reuniu-se com os ministros da Previdência, Carlos Lupe, e do Desenvolvimento, o vice-presidente Geraldo Alckmin. Professor Dr. Martin Kocher, thank you very much for this interview. Thanks a lot for having me. Agradeço também a todos os web espectadores que assistem a este programa. Esta entrevista está sendo gravada no estúdio do Poder 360 em Brasília em 15 de abril de 2024. Para ficar sempre bem informado, inscreva-se no canal do Poder 360, ative as notificações e não perca nenhuma informação relevante. A entrevista a partir de agora será em inglês. Mr. Kocher, what are the main challenges regarding economy and labor uh, today? Well, there are lots of challenges at the moment, I guess. Uh, I mean, there's always challenges, of course, and they change over time. But when we come to the economy, it's, of course, for a small, a relatively small country like Austria, uh, we see a certain fragmentation of world trade that makes it more difficult, of course, to succeed in exports. We've seen uh, uh, developments in uh, prices, especially in energy prices, that uh, makes it more difficult Uh, to remain competitive. Uh, we have seen, uh, of course, uh, developments in terms of uh, uh, world uh, uh, order, in terms of uh, conflicts that makes it more difficult to work together. So there's lots of challenges that companies are facing. And particularly in Europe, we also see, uh, of course, a scarcity uh, of labor uh, given uh, the aging of the population. So um, the workforce shrinks or doesn't grow as quickly as uh, the last uh, uh, decades. Uh, and so that uh, creates an additional problem and challenge for companies to attract uh, new groups of workers, uh, to uh, have the right incentives uh, that uh, people start working. Uh, it's, of course, also a challenge not only for companies. It's a challenge uh, for uh, uh, the uh, uh, political sphere, uh, making sure that we have uh, all Uh, the conditions in place uh, that respond to these challenges uh, correctly, which is not easy because many of these challenges arose very shortly uh, after uh, the first month of uh, the pandemic. Uh, you remember perhaps the supply chain problems. Uh, you remember, of course, uh, some of the other issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think uh, the world has uh, um, developed uh, in a very quick way that made it more difficult to respond and all the countries are struggling uh, to find the right responses. In what way those challenges are similar in Brazil and Austria being two very different countries? Uh, that's a good point. I think there is quite a lot of similarities. When we talk about uh, fragmentation of world trade, when we talk about uh, energy prices, energy supply, I think uh, uh, the entire world is more or less in the same boat. Um, there's, of course, differences between the countries in terms of Uh, the priorities uh, in the uh, industries, uh, the specific uh, um, specializations. There is uh, quite a lot of differences between the Brazil and Austria. Brazil is much larger than Austria, but there's also commonalities when it comes to uh, the necessity of skilling uh, as many workers as possible, making sure that education and reskilling and upskilling initiatives uh, for adults are uh, at the best uh, pace that we can achieve because that's something uh, that will be, uh, I think, uh, a joint challenge for all countries. Uh, the technologies change quickly, the world changes quickly, so we have to make sure that uh, workers, uh, that uh, uh, people are up to speed with these developments uh, and all countries are trying to find the best ways uh, to educate as many people as possible, uh, to keep people in the workforce, to make sure uh, that uh, they are up to speed with uh, the technological developments that they are facing in offices and uh, in production. What will be the impact of artificial intelligence in years to come or even in the case to come if it's possible to forecast? Well, it's very difficult to forecast. <laughs> if we knew that, of course, uh, life would be much easier. And uh, we, had, uh, we have seen a lot of forecasts over the last uh, decades uh, for technological developments that were often wrong uh, in hindsight when you look back. So I think uh, 
uh, artificial intelligence will change the way we work, it will change the workplace, it will change the skills uh, that we need, it will change uh, the uh, uh, speed of work perhaps, but it will also offer uh, enormous opportunities to make the workplace better, to focus on those things where humans are much better than uh, processes, uh, automation, and that's creativity, that's emotional intelligence, uh, that's uh, teamwork. All these things will become more important. Uh, I think the discussion that we have at the moment is sometimes uh, occupied by too much fear. Uh, yes, indeed, some of the tasks that we'll do every day uh, will be taken over by artificial intelligence or some automotive, uh, pro uh, automotive processes. But on the other hand, that frees up time for those tasks that we usually like more and that uh, usually also guarantee higher incomes. Uh, the difficult thing is, of course, making sure that everybody can follow this transition in a way that we don't lose too many jobs and that the jobs that are created, the new jobs that are created, that these jobs can be filled with people uh, that uh, otherwise lose their jobs because they are replaced by uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, on top of that, I think, uh, when we go beyond the workplace in terms of research, in terms of uh, tackling the large problems that the world has, artificial intelligence uh, provides uh, unique opportunities. On the other hand, we have to make sure uh, that there is regulation in place that protects people and that makes sure uh, that uh, the technology is used in the, best interest of, in the best interest of mankind. And the European Union has passed very quickly uh, an Artificial Intelligence Act uh, that tries to regulate artificial intelligence in a way that makes sure that this is uh, fulfilled, but on the other hand, should not harm technological advance. Now, uh, what will be the result of this visit uh, to Brazil? I hope uh, that uh, the uh, Brazilian-Austrian relationship that uh, uh, lasts for around 200 years now, 200 years of diplomatic relationship, uh, that uh, we are able to deepen this relationship, especially when it comes uh, to economic ties, especially when it comes to people-to-people -people exchange. Um, there is a lot of institutions in place uh, that we can build on, but we have to revive them. We have to make sure that uh, we work together more closely. I think uh, it's about time to do that. Uh, but uh, as I said, the resources that we can build on uh, are very good. Uh, there is about 150 companies in Austria uh, that are having offices in Brazil. Many of them produce in Brazil. Um, there is enormous opportunities uh, to expand that. Uh, but there's also not there's quite a lot of companies also. Uh, Brazilian companies being active in Austria. Um, we want to make sure that we exchange uh, ideas, uh, both when it comes to technology, uh, but also when it comes uh, to skilling initiatives uh, for the workforce. We have signed uh, a memorandum of understanding just uh, uh, an hour uh, ago, where we, we deepen our economic relationship. We have signed a letter of intent to work together more closely when it comes uh, to uh, the development of skills in the workforce. So all these things, I think, are a sign that Austria uh, has a lot of interest uh, in working more closely together with Brazil. And I was uh, welcomed uh, very warmly uh, and generously here, and I'm very thankful for that because it shows that also Brazil is interested in deepening the relationship with Austria. Now, you, uh, you just relaunched an uh, initiative, uh, Partnership, which was first launched in 1987, is that right? That's right. We have uh, an institution that's called uh, the Joint Economic uh, Committee, uh, where there's regular, there should be regular meetings mm -hmm. um, where countries talk about projects, government to government, but also, of course, bring uh, businesses together, companies together, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, there is information, there is foreign direct investment, there is uh, uh, technological uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, and uh, as you said, uh, this committee hasn't uh, uh, met for almost 40 years, which I think is a shame. So this was a deliberate choice to come here uh, and uh, reinstall uh, the committee. Um, we have talked about that uh, with the vice president. And uh, there will be a formal meeting next year in Vienna. I'm looking very much forward to this meeting. Uh, it should give us uh, a leverage for actually leveraging projects together, uh, working more closely together, and 
uh, deepening the economic relationship. Uh, it's only a comedy, of course, only, but uh, it's an important signal also uh, of the commitment of both sides to work more closely together. Well, if, if I'm not wrong, yeah. the last minister in your position that came here was, uh, what, 40, uh, 64 years ago? Is that right? <laughs> uh, yes, actually, uh, we did some research. Actually, when we decided uh, mm -hmm. uh, to plan this visit, I didn't even know that. There were mm -hmm. a couple of visits, bilateral visits, uh, mm -hmm. over the last 10 to 15 years uh, mm -hmm. by the Austrian president, uh, of course, uh, the Austrian ch chancellor and uh, the Brazilian president and uh, the Austrian president and Brazilian president. They met uh, at international meetings, but uh, you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, intensifying also bilateral visits uh, is an important aspect, uh, and especially when it comes uh, to the Ministry uh, of Labour and Economy, uh, it was about time to be here. I also invited uh, my um, uh, colleagues uh, from Brazil to come to Vienna. I'm hopeful mm. that uh, we'll have a uh, meeting soon in Vienna and uh, intensify the relationship because uh, waiting for 60 years is not an option anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, many Brazilian economists uh, are very fond of the ideas of Austrian classical economists. Friedrich uh, Hayek and Ludwig uh, uh, von Mises. There is even a Mises Institute in Brazil. So what do you think of this, <laughs> this admiration, let's say so? Oh, that's a, that's a very important point. Of course, so Austria uh, has a, a lot of uh, famous economists uh, from mm -hmm. that period. Uh, they um, provided very thought-provoking ideas um, nowadays, of course, we know uh, that many of these ideas were right. Some of these ideas uh, were not right, as always, uh, you learn over time. And uh, many mm -hmm. of them uh, had a very strong philosophical approach uh, to uh, solve economic problems. Uh, since I was an economist before I joined politics, uh, I know nowadays that uh, uh, economics have become, uh, has become much more empirical. And I try to uh, base the decisions that I take as a politician on empirical facts, on the evidence. Uh, and that makes it sometimes a bit more difficult because um, ideas that are uh, too one-sided, they don't survive anymore because you have to take uh, the intricacies and uh, the diversity of reality into account. But of course, uh, the, the names you mentioned, uh, they were very influential economists. Uh, and uh, some of uh, our ideas nowadays build on their uh, work, um, and uh, it's good to know uh, that they are still also known in uh, Brazil, far away from their, from their home, actually. Well, they, they, they are very present in the debate, because, you know, there's a debate on whether the state should uh, sponsor development or not. And, of course, those economists, uh, they, 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 they think citizens and, uh, well, uh, workers and entrepreneurs should, should, should hold it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this debate of what you think of in, in, in today's global, uh, global situation it could be placed? So there is a, a very active debate in economics nowadays, in uh, scholarly economics, uh, what is the role of the public sector, what is the role of the private sector. This has been always the case. And we know, of course, that a strong private sector is very important for uh, uh, prosperity uh, because uh, property rights help a lot to solve economic problems. And many economic problems are problems of cooperation. And cooperation is much easier if you have clear property rights. If you don't have property rights, it's much mm -hmm. more complicated. On the other hand, and that's uh, something we know also uh, for a long time, but now uh, some newer results by famous economists have reaffirmed uh, uh, this idea is uh, that there has to be uh, a, a public sector that guarantees these property rights. There has to be a public sector that invests um, strategically. Um, the balance between public and private investments have to be there. Infrastructure is a very important aspect. Some of the infrastructure can be provided uh, privately, but some of it uh, cannot be provided privately. So there is mm -hmm. uh, a role for uh, uh, a public sector and public investments and a strong role for uh, good uh, politics. Um, I, I tend to think of it as, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as complementarities. And there is uh, an American economist, uh, uh, Darren Archimoglu, who wrote a book called The Narrow Corridor, I think is the title of the book. Uh, and he tells us, and I think that's a very uh, interesting insight, uh, there has to be this balance between private investments, private initiatives, strong institutions that uh, guarantee 
uh, property, but also these public investments that go hand in hand, always in a democratic society, uh, making sure that there is no corruption. Corruption is the worst uh, in development. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the picture uh, that is painted nowadays uh, in modern empirical economics is a much more diverse one. Uh, and of course, that makes it more difficult uh, to uh, find the right policies in politics. Uh, but I think it's worthwhile doing it. And I try to, to follow this evidence when I, uh, when I design policies in Austria. Is there uh, anything that wasn't asked here and you would like to, to point out? No, I just want to point out that it's a real pleasure uh, to be here in Brazil and to learn a lot. I mean, um, the two countries are quite far from each other geographically. On the other hand, uh, when, we talk, when we look at history, when, when we look at culture, there is some commonalities uh, that uh, many people probably don't even know, actually, uh, in the 19th century, beginning of 19th century, Austria was one of the first countries of the European Union to recognize uh, Brazil and to, mm -hmm. um, uh, and to, have, uh, uh, to have diplomatic relations, formal diplomatic relations. Uh, there is, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, the imperial heritage uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, binds us together. Uh, and so I think mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, lots of reasons, not only uh, coming from uh, the uh, nowadays perspective uh, of economic ties to work together more closely, but also uh, historical reasons. And uh, I'm looking forward uh, uh, to, as I said, deepen this relationship between Austria and Brazil. E chega ao final essa edição do Poder Entrevista. Mr. Cohort, thank you very much for this interview. Thanks a lot for having me. Agradeço também a todos os web espectadores que assistiram este programa. Esta entrevista foi gravada no estúdio do Poder 360, em Brasília, em 15 de abril de 2024. Para ficar sempre bem informado, inscreva-se no canal do Poder 360, ative as notificações e não perca nenhuma informação relevante. Muito obrigado e até a próxima! Poder Monitor. Acesse agora e ganhe 30 dias grátis.